Are these paintings abstract? Well, yes, because the primary subject matter is sensa. Reds and blues and greens and various colors organized into rectangular shapes, and those sensa have been abstracted from or taken away from the natural world of objects and events and placed here on the canvas all by themselves. These paintings ignore the things of reality in order to concentrate on the sensa of reality, the visible qualities, that is the colors and shapes, which are normally attached to the things of reality. So if there are no explicit references to objects or events from the external world, what habit does that liberate us from, as we saw in the last video? From the habit of using sensa merely as signs, which point beyond themselves to the objects or events of which they were a part. And if there are no references to objects or events from the outside natural world, then there is no specific mention of either time or place. And if we are free of the past and the future, that means we are strongly encouraged to experience the present moment, the here and the now. We are free to focus our vision and achieve an intensity of experience that is absolutely unique, almost impossible to achieve in our ordinary waking moments. Okay, let's analyze the form. Let's see how Rothko is arranging and interpreting the sensor. The underlying blue rectangle is cool and recessive, tends to stay in the background, as blue often tends to do. There's a pronounced vertical emphasis accented by the way the bands of blue gradually expand upward. The green and rusty rectangles are smaller than the blue one, but more prominent because they stretch out across the blue. They have a horizontal thrust that quiets or counterbalances the upward thrust. Therefore, the vertical and horizontal dimensions are brought together in peaceful equilibrium. The rectangles work together, so to speak, in a kind of gentle, balanced harmony. Part of the way they accomplish their mission is by the way their lines, or edges, are soft and irregular, rather than hard and straight, like the Mondrian painting, for example. Straight lines isolate or separate. Soft, blurry lines merge and join. One exception is the outside blue lines, which serve to separate all three rectangles from the outside world. The green rectangle is solid and secure looking, comes the closest to being square, which gives it a certain solidity, stability, a weighty presence. It's situated in the lower half of the canvas in such a way as to anchor the painting, not only because it is large and substantial looking, but also because it is green. Green is a quiet and restful color. It doesn't excite us with joy or sorrow or passion. It soothes us with a sense of quiet stability. The green has slight variations in it of light and dark patches, of color saturations, and these variations impart a slight sense of movement to the rectangle. But the movement is congealed in a stable pattern. The overall effect is a kind of earthy stability. It's a rectangle that stays put. It's not itching to move someplace else. The rusty red rectangle is the smallest of the three, seems to be less substantial, less stable, less solid and secure. If the blue rectangle recedes, and if the green rectangle stays put, this one tends to move toward us. The green rectangle, therefore, is firmly locked in place in between the blue and the red rectangles. The green rectangle mediates between the cool and receding blue rectangle and the warm and advancing red rectangle. Unlike the others, the rusty red rectangle seems light, floating, radiating with more energy. The red contains more variations in color, more light and dark areas, more visible brush strokes. Therefore, the red rectangle is more active, more dynamic. The effect is that of self-contained movement, which keeps the red floating like a cloud above the green. This floating effect is enhanced by the blue, 
which serves as a kind of sky or framing background for the red. And yet, despite the inner dynamic activity of the red rectangle, it basically keeps its place. It doesn't overwhelm its neighbors. And finally, we can notice that there is a delicate violet tinge binding everything together. All the parts are locked together in an image of eternity, as your text says. So abstract painters take those qualities from the visible world, which we call sensa, and plop them on a canvas. They seize the most transient, changing, impermanent aspects of reality and make them stand still so that we can enter into a relationship with them. What kind of relationship? Well, if we genuinely participate, we have the chance to focus our vision very intensely, something we don't ordinarily do. We have the chance to enter into a state of heightened awareness as something we also don't ordinarily do. And if we participate, we have the chance to push aside the distractions of the past, the distractions of the future, and to merge ourselves with the present moment. If we participate, we have the chance to move beyond time, that is, beyond the framework of a past and a future, and to experience a sense of timelessness, which is a very rare experience in ordinary life. And what kind of moment is beyond time, beyond the reach of time, beyond the passage of time, beyond the relentless tick of the clock? To be outside of time is to experience a moment of eternity. To be outside of time is to get a sense of the eternal then, because the eternal is by definition beyond the reach of time. Just as to be beyond the limitations of space is to experience a sense of the infinite. And those kind of experiences, the experience of the eternal, the experience of the infinite, are often called sacred experiences. So abstract paintings like this one provide the stage or the setting or the opportunity or the excuse for the sensitive individual that is one who can participate with such a painting to enter into a kind of communion with the sacred, to engage in a spiritual experience.